Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Benio. On this episode, I have Luis Lopez Portillo. Luis is a journalist, writer, business owner, consultant, and life coach. Uh, in this episode, we talk about his new book that he just put out and talk about his background and some of the work that he's doing. He has a bachelor's in uh, communications. He also has a part of an Alfred Friendly Fellowship in journalism, which he did and was a journalist for a handful of years. He was a big editor in chief at a big newspaper in El Salvador and was the, or the former press secretary for one of the former presidents of El Salvador for the, the one term of five years. He is the founder and CEO of Rethos, which is his um, company that he uses for doing organizational culture shifts, change management, crisis management, communication strategies, etc. And he is the author of two books, uh, the one that we talked about on uh, this episode is Evolve and Restart, Personal Reinvention and Sustainable Change, Applying the Restart Mindset. Um, one of the things that I really enjoy about having the podcast is that I get to talk to all sorts of different people. And so I'm always trying to broaden my horizons. And so um, I like the work that Luis does. And so I wanted to get him on here and talk about his book, but also kind of his background and, and what um, he feels passionate about within uh, kind of different circles. In the conversation, we talk about his overview, uh, this kind of personal professional background that he has. We talk about his background and training in journalism and communications and his you know, kind of evolution and story with that. We talk about how, you know, he switched to uh, public relations, um, so still within the communications world, but public relations more specifically, um, and his time as press secretary, one of the former presidents of El Salvador. Um, and we talked about his post-government work, his own consulting company, dealing with crisis management within companies. Um, talk about the types of work that he does in organizational and cultural change with businesses, and he gives various examples about that. We didn't have a discussion of his restart method for personal change, which is kind of the accumulation of all of his experiences um, in different uh, places and different settings um, and how he's really compiled um, kind of a lifetime of experiences trying to put it in a, uh, a book and format that's very tangible and, and practical for, for many people. Um, he talks about you know, kind of the inspiration for writing it, some of the running threads throughout the book, how it's divided into two big sections. And then we talk about the applied aspects of his uh, book and the ultimate aim and use for the book's tenets. Um, one of the things that we, we talk about in the conversation is this kind of idea of the, the right place uh, and the right aspects of looking at... Um, being a life coach or doing some type of life training or coaching. And, and so while he, he doesn't really like the term self-help, and I don't either, um, it probably would fit in that kind of bucket, but it's much more than that as you hear in the conversation. And, and um, he really is about personal growth, and, um, which, is, which is really, really important. Um, I think one of the other nice things about this conversation and just about Luis and his story is, um, you know, kind of... His setting. He's you know, born, raised in El Salvador. He still lives there, and and it's really, really nice to see and hear about um, places around the world and in different countries where there's an emphasis on trying to um, work on um, creation and trying to build things in a very realistic and yet positive way. And so, you know, kind of Luis's story and mission is that. You know, how do how do we deal with crisis? How do we how do we have good um, true personal shifts um, and using the resources that one has. And so there is a very much a um, creation mindset, which is something that's very respectable and I, I really appreciate. Um, it was a great conversation. I really, really enjoyed it. 
Um, I uh, hope everyone also pulls something else from it as well, um, both whether it's in his you know, personal story, which is fascinating to me. I really enjoyed that. And in his book, which is also uh, quite good. So now I bring you Luis Lopez Portillo. I am here with Luis Lopez Portillo. Luis, very nice of you to come on. I appreciate it. How are you? Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, very good. Doing good. Doing good. No, that's great to hear. So uh, why don't, before we get into uh, some of the content here today, why don't you just tell listeners uh, just, you know, kind of your, your elevator pitch of who you are and uh, what you do and um, what your work is and, and some of the, the things that you uh, particularly um, write on. Okay, so um, um, my specialty is um, cultural change. I've been working with um, uh, my company uh, has it's turned 17 years old this year. Wow, wow. So long I've been, time. I've been, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, didn't realize that until, you know, uh, until the pandemic. I've uh, mm. been doing this for for quite some time, 17 years as an, you know, independent uh, entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. My company works with, with uh, all type of uh, companies, uh, small, medium, large. And um, I started with uh, communication strategy. Mm -hmm. Then I went into change management in all this time i've been doing crisis management that's how, that's how my company started you know most of my first gigs were uh crisis management because i came out from from the government i worked for five years mm -hmm. with the government in the you know the communications office and four of those five years i spent doing crisis management so mm -hmm. that was like my specialty at that moment. Mm -hmm. And it still is, I still do it. Mm -hmm. But I've, you know, I've learned a lot and grown a lot. And today I'm, I'm in culture, culture mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. In terms of uh, work culture or? or... Yeah. Uh -huh. work culture. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. yeah. We want to go from this toxic culture. We want to go into a service culture mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just to name, you know, some of the cases I see, mm -hmm. uh, and those are processes, and and all these processes have to have to deal with uh, with personal change, with leadership, uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. so um, that's what I do, and that's uh, you know that's my second book, uh, it's personal change. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, no, that's that's great. That's great. Now, uh, tell listeners uh, your. Uh, you're, you're not based in the United States. Tell us where you're based at and, and uh, maybe if you want to just give a, a little bit of a background about yourself as much as you want and, um, and we can kind of build from there. Yeah, so I live in San Salvador, El Salvador. That's where I'm based. Uh, before the pandemic, I was traveling five, six times a year uh, to Miami because my older daughter uh, was living in Miami at that time. So we had a, you know, we had a place there mm -hmm. and I was, you know, starting, I had, I had been for one year in uh, 2018, I had been working on having like an office in Miami to mm -hmm. work with clients in the United States and Latin America. Mm -hmm. Uh, then the pandemic came. So I had to stop that for a while and I had to reinvent myself. Mm. Um, but yeah, I haven't, you know, I've traveled twice to the States, uh, after the pandemic, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, two of my children live over there mm -hmm. and I have a lot of ties to the United States. So, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm in San Salvador right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's where I work. I have clients in the whole Central American region, you know, companies mm -hmm. I work for. Uh, so in other other countries in, in Central America, so you know, Honduras, Guatemala, yes, Guatemala, Nicaragua. Honduras, mm -hmm. uh, and Nicaragua mostly. I've I've done some things in in Panama as well. Mm, nice. And then El Salvador, of, of course. And El Salvador, which is yeah, you know yeah. most of my clients 
are in El Salvador. After the pandemic, this um, you know this breakdown has shifted a little bit. So I'm doing more <laughs> yeah. uh, digital work yeah. in Central America. That's that's kind of interesting. That's kind of the you know the sil sil silver linings of the pandemic in yeah, terms of, of of my business and my you know my own professional reinvention process. Mm -hmm. Do you do you have any clients here in the states or or, or no not, not so much? Uh, I'm gonna do a, a, like a training in mm -hmm. August mm -hmm. uh, for a client in Virginia. As a matter okay. of fact, cool. and I've had you know I have I have I've had a couple of clients in the in the states, but there are you know four or five uh, projects a, a year. Hmm. Very nice, very nice, and so. I know a little bit um, uh, from talking with you that you you and you kind of mentioned it. Uh, you didn't start out um, with 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 doing this, you know, kind of this organizational type of work um, and, and crisis management work. Uh, where where are your kind of uh, roots? Uh, where did you start out, uh, or any you know, if you want to say you know, college degrees or anything or anything like that? But where did you kind of start and kind of start out and then kind of just walk us through the trajectory? Uh, uh, be, okay, be curious great. to hear that. So I, I started in uh, communications uh, science, uh, a major in communication science. I studied, I studied here in mm -hmm. El Salvador, mm -hmm. and then I started teaching. I have, um, you know, I've teaching. I've, I've taught for more than twenty years uh, at the college level here, mm -hmm. and then um, so my my line of of work started when I was 19 years old. It started uh, in communications. I actually started working in advertising, mm. but then I spent like five years in journalism. Mm. And uh, journalism is is one of my you know uh, most uh, important uh, professional uh, bases. You know because uh, because of the writing and the research and you know, writing books, uh, I've written two books. Mm -hmm. uh, it has a lot to do with my, you know, with my research skills, uh, writing skills, translation skills, mm -hmm. because I read a lot, mm -hmm. but you know, by writing books, you know, I feel that my duty is to translate what I know into practical terms and you know information you can use and that's that has to do a lot with my journalism career uh in um what, what kind of journalism was it if you what, yeah i mean i'm i don't know if you had like a beat or something like that but did you or what kinds I, of pieces or what would you write i on? worked um i was hired as a as an editor ah. because of my background and because of my you know type of um because it was very um it was back then when i started it was uh not many of the writers that had degrees mm. at that time mm. so i had a solid academic foundation so they hired me as an editor but they sent me to the streets for six months mm. so for six months i covered everything mm. you mm. name it so that in the united states or, or there in el salvador no el salvador. That, that was my ah. my schooling that was my you know ah. my practical introduction to journalism so i did i, I did everything so but wow. but what i liked most was um i helped open the business section hmm. a newspaper where i worked they had no business section back hmm. then we're talking uh 26 years ago mm -hmm. uh, so i helped open the the uh start the business section so that was if you ask for a favorite beat it was business mm -hmm. But then I started, you know, doing my duties as as, as an editor. Hmm. Um, but I kept writing. I always wrote. And uh, after two years in newspaper, I went to a fellowship. Hmm. Uh, for eight months, I spent in the states. Uh, so this fellowship is an Alfred Friendly Press Fellowship. Which Alfred Friendly was a Washington Post editor in the '60s. Mm -hmm. So his family started this program where they bring every year, they bring 15, 10 to 15 journalists from around the world. Mm. They still do it. They're still going strong. Wow. Uh, I don't know what's going on with the pandemic, but I, I keep in touch with them. Mm. So to this date, I, to this date I've, I'm the only Central American to, to have participated in that. Really? Wow. That fellowship. Wow. So what was the fellowship? I, it was eight months. So I spent two 
weeks at the University of Maryland, which you know is one of the best journalism schools in the country. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah. <laughs> funded by, you know, funded by, in part by the Washington Post. Mm -hmm. And um, two intensive weeks uh, at, the, at the University of Maryland. And then I was assigned to the Sun Sentinel, for, uh, Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel. Mm -hmm. That's a newspaper where I worked. Mm -hmm. So I would spend one month there, and then we would go back for two two more intense weeks at the university. So that was the that was the fellowship. So it's eight months. And then you had the, you know, you had the obligation to go back to your to your country and to your newspaper and apply what you had learned. Mm. Because the 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 objective of the program was to bring you know best practices and mm -hmm. freedom of the press mm -hmm. principles to 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 all countries around the world. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of um, participation from Africa and from Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the fellows come from 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 Asia and Africa, and some from East Europe and. Not many from Latin American. Uh, I don't know why. Because I, I think it's because the, the newspaper you work for, they have to they have to sign, um, you know, like a, like an agreement mm -hmm. to keep your job mm -hmm. and to pay part of your salary while you you go away. So that, yeah, I think I that's a, that's that's very hard for many newspapers sure, around yeah. the world. Yeah. So. Um, so I, I came back, I started, um, I continued to work on the newspaper, one of the main newspapers uh, in El Salvador, La Prensa Gráfica. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, then I got married and then I went into, I switched, I, I switched to, to PR, to mm -hmm. corporate communications. Why, why the switch? Because um, I, um, I quit. I, you know, uh, four of the editors we had a um, we had a disagreement mm -hmm. in principles. Mm, I see. So we left. We just left. Uh, so I was I was unemployed for almost one month. Wow. So you had you had what some people say the creative differences, and then you just say, you know, we're yeah. out of here, and and that's it. So yeah. So then you so you then you you didn't pivot to you know like another paper or something else in journalism. You wanted to do something different. That was by choice, or you just kind of fell into it, or you know to do. PR. Yeah, I was I was um, I there's only two major newspapers here. Sure. So I didn't want to go to a competition. Ah. I and I wasn't interested in TV or radio. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, that was the paper to work for that. You know, I was happy sure. there. Sure, sure. Uh, so that was one of the reinventions in my life. Uh, you know, I talk, I talk about that period of mm -hmm. my life in my second book, mm -hmm. because uh, when my second daughter was born, I was unemployed. Mm. So that was, uh, you know, a pivotal, pivotal um, time in my life when I had to change. Mm -hmm. basically change careers. Sure. So I went to work for this uh, think tank, you know, mm -hmm. like the Pew Research, mm -hmm. uh, this is Fusades, mm -hmm. which is the main think tank mm -hmm. here in El Salvador. Uh, I went to work for them and I, I went to work at the communications department. I see. So then I, I, I switched uh, to, uh, you know, a new, new thing for me, uh, but I had studied communication. So I had, to, I had, to, I the foundation. foundation. Yeah, 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 yeah. From there, uh, I it was very interesting what I was doing because there was a lot of ignorance about you know uh, PR is a big industry nowadays, but uh, back in yeah. that back in that time, that's 30, 30, uh, 23 years ago exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, there was you know the, it was it was uh, there was a lot to learn. And since I, I've been reading in English since I was 18, mm -hmm. you know, and then Amazon came. So I, you know, I read 95% of what I read is in English. Mm -hmm. So if I need to know something, I go to Amazon, buy a book and, you know, and, and, and self-educate. Mm -hmm. So um, I have, I have, I've had this mindset uh, since I was 18, since I started working. So um, bought some books, went to seminars. I remember I went to this huge 
you know, PR crisis communication uh, thing in Boston mm. that kind of, you know, opened my eyes and, you know, brought a lot of knowledge and, you know, my, 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 my employer uh, paid for it. And uh, so, so I was, you know, I was very excited for that new um, path in my professional life. And then two years later, I went to work for the government. So I worked for five years with the government, with the government that the communications office, uh, with the government that was had a lot of crisis. Hmm. We had uh, dollarization. Mm -hmm. We had numerous strikes. Mm -hmm. We had a public uh, transportation strike. We had a doctor's strike. And we had two earthquakes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was like my PhD in, in crisis management. <laughs> which, which, uh, for, for listeners, uh, probably not so familiar. I'm not entirely familiar as well. Um, we obviously know how government is organized here in the United States um, and, and maybe other uh, Western countries. But in El Salvador, how is the government, which branch of government did you work for? And, and how is it just kind of loosely organized, just for context? I, I worked, uh, it would be the equivalent of working at the White House. Mm -hmm. So I work for the, for the president, which is the executive branch. Yep. And uh, it's pretty much like in the states, uh, legislative okay. branch, uh, executive Judicial. branch, and, and judiciary. Okay. So they're mostly independent. Okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so you had all these crises that were happening. You, like you were saying, there's a bunch of strikes, the dollarization. So uh, listeners may not know that El Salvador uses uh, the U.S. dollar as its currency. Um, it's our official currency since uh, 2000? 2000, yeah. That's right, yeah. Um, they, they don't use any other currency. Uh, the old... Uh, was it uh, colones? I think is what they were. Colon, yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, uh, <laughs> recently, they use they they now use Bitcoin as as well. It's interesting. A little little bit of news for them recently. <laughs> yeah. Um. So so yeah. So you have all of these uh, issues going on. So what was your job in 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 uh, the communications uh, uh, aspect of the executive branch to try and you know give good information or what was the main thing you were or managing the crisis? How what was your yeah, was role in that? It was basically, but I had to deal with the press. Um, yeah, my yeah. official job was as a press director. Uh -huh. So I had to deal with uh, me and my team. We had to deal with the, with the press, everything. So we had to uh, facilitate uh, communications. We try to implement a spokesman's hmm. uh, uh, figure here, but it didn't work. You know, uh, journalists here want to take their information directly from the president. Mm -hmm. So I worked directly with the president, uh, but I worked, I did a lot of work with the, with the uh, secretaries mm -hmm. because they, there was a lot of um, training to do. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started in training because I, you know, I, I will, I've, I've always been a teacher. Okay. Sure. My mom is a teacher. My grandmother is a teacher. I've always been a teacher. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's in my nature to teach and train and, you know, and, and, and guide you on how to, how to do things. So mm -hmm. my thing was uh, media training back then. Mm. So that's, that's, that's a lot in, in managing the, you know, the communication for the president. Mm -hmm. And then, but I had a lot, I, I did a lot of training with the, with the, with the secretaries because uh, it was a very um, technical cabinet. The, 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 you know, most of them came from the private sector. Mm. You know, most of them didn't come from politics. Mm. They weren't politicians. So there was a lot of training to do. Mm. So I spent my, those five years, you know, training, uh, dealing with uh, information issues from the office of the president and dealing with crisis, so communi crisis communication. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's basically what I, what I did. Mm -hmm. And so you were so, there the whole a, term, the five, you said five years? Yeah, five years. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, it's time. a huge school. <laughs> it's a, it's a, it's a very rich school. It's a, it's an uh, amazing experience. So you learn so much. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. 
And uh, so, so in doing all that, you know, as you were mentioning, there was many crises, you know, were you able to kind of see, you know, kind of, kind of you were saying, it's kind of like school of hard knocks, right? You were able to like, you know, okay, here's all these problems. Um, uh, how are we going to manage this? And how do, how do we talk about it and, 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 and communicate things effectively? And so by the end of, at least in your estimation, by the end of the, the time that you were there, the five years, could you look back and say, ah, this was tough and we dealt with this the best we could or, or that uh, we made improvements on the procedures of how to do things or whether the next administration did it or they did not? How could you see kind of at the end of it? Was it like something that was like, yes, I, I, I feel proud of that work or, or still a lot of tough issues or we should have done more? What was just kind of your sense in leaving that? I mean, I, I left with a sense of gratitude. I mean, I learned so much. I, um, I'm still good friends with many of those people in that cabinet that, you know, most of them went back to the private sector. Mm -hmm. So uh, a good part of, of, of my first clients were people that had worked with that government. And then after sure. five years, they went back to their you know, that was a businesses or mm -hmm. whatever they were in the private sector. Mm -hmm. So most of my first clients in the first year of my company were came from that network of people I met there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, but it was all, all learning, all learning. And, mm -hmm. and I liked it. I, you know, I liked, I really enjoyed working, solving problems. Mm. You know, I, I became real good at solving problems and not being afraid of problems and finding a way around, finding a way to help solve it and communicate it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because what I learned is, is with many of those issues is it, it, it has to do a lot of the way you communicate it, the way you explain things. Sure. So I, yeah, I, can, I, I can say I learned a lot about uh, about handling problems, mm -hmm. about communication, about dealing with emotions, mm -hmm. because in a crisis, the first thing you have to deal with is is the intensity of emotions. Sure. People get scared. People people panic. People um, become paralyzed by fear. So uh, I think that there was a lot of learning in that uh, in the, in my my permanent study of the human condition mm. of human nature. I'm, I'm a big fan, a big learner. I'm a big student of human nature, of human behavior. Mm -hmm. So those five years were so, so, so full of, of learning uh, because people in uh, um, political, you know, political circles mm -hmm. behave weirdly behave mm -hmm. you know <laughs> they, they all have an agenda they all have to push their interests and, and it's so interesting all the things that you learn by dealing with all those issues you know for five years so yeah yeah so now uh, how did i feel I, I still feel very grateful for all i learned and and the good thing is i you know i, I was never a politician i was always a technician mm -hmm. so i went in five years the term ended and i went out <laughs> right so no 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 motivation to stay there or anything I, yeah exactly. i've heard that too from other people they're not really into it um so and then, then go ahead, I, sorry. yeah and then i i i went in you know and and, and started my company Yes, yeah, so I was going to ask. So then you, after this, you, you started your uh, the consulting company. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you, as you said, you've been doing it now 17 years, which is, which is a long time. And, and I can imagine, um, you know, a lot of that was uh, kind of solidifying a lot of the things that you, you know, learned working in government and, and doing it in the private sector and, you know, refining those skills and learning more and all those things. So um Maybe just briefly just explain, uh, you know, what the company is and what it does, and then you can lead us into why you decided to, you know, I guess 15 years later or so, decided to take the cumulative experiences and put them to, you know, pen to paper and kind of write about some of the things you've learned. 
Okay, so I'll briefly describe uh, three projects I'm working on right now. Sure, yeah. Okay, so one is a crisis. Mm -hmm. The client is in Guatemala. Mm -hmm. Okay, I was recommended from someone here and uh, we've been managing uh, managing uh, the whole thing in by Zoom and phone and what I do is I, you know, I, I listen to their case. What are the risks? Um, this is a company, they, they're having an issue with the uh, government mm -hmm. authority. And in the, apparently it's a huge, big misunderstanding, but it, but it has grown into kind of a political persecution. Okay. Sure. Sure. So many things at stake. Uh, so they have to communicate. So they have to manage it, mm -hmm. communicate it well. So that's where I, you know, I, I, I advise them. Uh, I work the messaging with them. I work the, how do you, how do you, how do you communicate with channels? Uh, what's the message and how do you go about managing public opinion? Okay. It's, it's your word against other words against, you know, and you have to deal with the people not happy. You have to de deal with nervous uh, employees and you have to deal with all stakeholders that get nervous mm -hmm. because you're in the news, you're in the news, you're in the, you're, you're in the, um, on everyone's you're on social media, the, yeah, the internet, talking. television, radio, <laughs> everyone's talking about you. So, yeah. uh, yeah, I've been doing that for 17 years, uh, after I, got out of government so that I still do that. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm going to tell you about a uh, uh, second project, which is what I enjoy the most, which is mm -hmm. a cultural change. Okay. Not that I don't like managing crisis, but this sure. is what I do. So working with a bank, it's a local bank. Uh, it's a, a small bank. Uh, they compete with uh, international banks, with, you know, from Canada, from Switzerland, from Colombia, from the States. So there's uh, not many local banks now a days here. So this is one of the small local banks. So they decided uh, at the start of the year that they wanted to compete through service. Okay, we, we don't have the best rates, we don't have the, you know, the best products, let's compete with service. So that, that has to go into our culture. Mm. So how do we upgrade our service culture? That's, mm. that's their, what they, so they found me and they said, listen, we want to we wanna go from this uh, standard of service to this, but that implies a, a change in culture. Mm. Okay, so, so that's what I do. So I, we're going through the process. We're halfway right now. Mm -hmm. So I do training, I do coaching, mm -hmm. and I do, you know, advisory. Because mm -hmm. my, my um, the way I work has a lot to do with my journalism background. Mm -hmm. In, so in at communications, the, yeah. Yes, and at the start of of every project, I'll I I do a lot of interviews. Hmm. So I I you know I put my journalist cap on. Yeah. And I and I dig and I dig and that's I cool. dig. Yeah, that's cool. The more I dig, the more I understand the pains in that particular culture. Hmm. So then I I'm doing these three things. I'm you know I'm doing coaching with leadership. I'm doing training with the, you know, with the front lines mm -hmm. and I am, I'm going back. I'm going back to, to management and say, listen, this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm seeing. I can help with this, but you know, this policy uh, is an issue. Everybody, everyone is uh, not happy with this policy. So maybe you should do, do something with this policy. So it's advisory coaching and training. Mm -hmm. And what I train them with is change is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, what, this is what change takes. It, it takes that you and you and you and you in a personal level, you have to change. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's exactly the topic of my, of my second book, you know, that sustainable change, personal mm -hmm. change. Mm -hmm. uh, but cultural change requires personal change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's what I preach and that's what I train. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's, um, I'm a big, uh, 
Stoics fan, mm -hmm. a big Buddhism fan, um, a CBT mm -hmm. fan. Um, I reading about psychology and human behavior all the time. So that's what I do, because I believe that for what I do, I have to understand human nature. And I've been studying human nature since I started, you know, since I became an avid reader. So that's what I do. And that's what I've written in my books. Um, uh, that's what I've learned from my experience dealing with organizations and dealing with, um, you know, human beings. Mm -hmm. So, and quickly, the third project I'm working on right now, mm -hmm. uh, he's in Honduras. And uh, I'm, we're doing, uh, I have a program that's called Team Energizer. And that's, that's a stress management program. Hmm. When you can't, when you can't, I found out this uh, several years ago. If you, if they won't let you help you with, you know, management and leadership and, you know, change at the higher levels, let me help your people. Okay. Yeah. Let, let me help your people how to deal with toxic bosses and toxic mm -hmm. cultures mm -hmm. because they're stressed. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's it's relevant that I say that 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 I had a health crisis in eight, eight nine years ago. Mm. Uh, I was a uh, you know I the burnout burnout sent me to the hospital. I was at the hospital. I I you know I. I was a fallen, you know, a fallen victim of stress, accumulated stress. Yeah. So, and nine years ago, I started, you know, in order to heal, I started studying about stress management. And, I, and, and that's what got me into um, dive deeper into all things brain. Okay. And, and that's my first, that, that's my first book. My first book is uh, about stress management uh, and where I write from my experience personal experience and from this program i started uh most five years ago so from the program that i do that i'm doing today i'm doing 100 percent virtual uh -huh. which is called team energizer i switched the name a couple of years ago to team energizer because the thing was uh you know my team is tired my team is stressed out my team is you know dragging their feet so the objective of the program is to energize uh, your team by teaching them, teaching them, you know, cognitive tricks. You know, the, how to use better your inner resources, mm -hmm. and that's a, you know that's a stoic concept. If we can't change what's around you, you change inside. You know, change your mind. You change how you manage your your inner resources. Mm -hmm. So that's a third project I can talk about. We have a, a weekly session. It's seven weeks. And we have a weekly session. It's a group of 24. It's a team of 24. Uh, management, middle management. And uh, if they like it, we're going with the rest of the, the teams in that company in Honduras. Yeah. So that's uh, those three projects. I hope that give you a, you know, a yeah, glimpse. Yeah, no, that's, that's a, that's a but great uh, kind of pulse of, of kind of, you know, what you do and kind of the, the nuts and bolts of it. And so that's, that's very uh, instructive. I'd say, you know, listening to what you're saying, that there is an element of kind of like uh, uh, leadership training and mentoring and coaching, but a lot of it, uh, because you're talking about the personal and cultural shift and change, you know, this reminds me a lot of, a lot of the work that a lot of, um, industrial organizational psychology does, you know, kind of IO psych or, or also known as business psychology. Sometimes um, yes. they do many components of this all, all the way back from uh, Abraham Maslow. Yes. Yes. He was, he was, he was definitely a he was humanist uh, psychologist and uh, but definitely branched out uh, into a lot of the organizational types of stuff. That's right. Yeah. And so, uh, yes, yes, I, 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 I hear a lot of those uh, components in, in what you're saying. So it's great. Um, so I guess, um, you, you know, the one last question before we jump into the book here is, you know, knowing all this stuff, I, I think m most people will will not know a whole lot of things about uh, uh, El Salvador or, or, or about uh, um, uh, Central America, 
uh, too much aside from what they hear in you know the news or whatever. But I think it's established that you know uh, El Salvador is still has a, a challenges with um, you know poverty and in many places in the, in the country it's very small and and then also um, you know uh, crime and, and and gangs and things like that. And and does does any of that uh, impact any of your work whatsoever? Um, or not really at all. You're not really touched by that kind of stuff. Well, not not personally. I mean, um, as I as I as I normally tell my family, you know, my daughters that they don't live here anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but my my youngest son still lives here. He's he's twelve. Uh, but I always tell them, you know, we we live in a bubble. You know, we don't, you know where we live. We you know we're not uh, exposed to. Mm -hmm. to that kind of problem but i but i do see the those issues with my clients yeah that's what i was mostly asking I about have, in terms of the clients have, you work with you know i have i have uh, you know i have participants in in my in my stress management programs mm -hmm. part of the stress is going back home because mm. they live in a complicated area sure. you know part, part of their stress their daily stress is going back and getting out of some terrible places we have here, uh, control, totally control, 100% controlled by gangs. Yeah. Well, that's what I, you know, that's what I preach with with management. I mean, you have to understand the personal aspect. You don't, you you, you can't expect that they leave the problems at the door. Sure. Yeah. And then they give it all, you know, give it 100, not 20, 200 percent for you here. <laughs> Right. Because you know, in after the pandemic, you know, we're, it's it's, um, it's 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 getting worse with the pandemic mm. because you have the health issue and the, you know the restrictions issues and being careful of the time and um, not you know having lost many of the things that you used to do to you know get away from the stress mm -hmm. of work and. Uh, so there's a lot of, I'm dealing um, lately, you know, since last year, I'm dealing a lot with, uh, with grief. Mm. I incorporated the, 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 you know, the grief issue yeah. into all these emotional topics uh, that I see in this, you know, stress management program. Mm. Um, and so I see it there. I see the causes of stress, the causes of anxiety have to do with, many times with the living conditions in cer certain areas of the country you know around the most of my work is uh, within the capital within sure. san salvador um i do have a client it's a school that's not here it's a school which is um, uh, in santana which is uh, an hour an hour away from here mm -hmm. but we're going to do it we're going to we're going to start in two weeks uh, it's a bilingual school in santana Mm -hmm. So they uh, they end the year. I think it's next week. So in two in two weeks, I start this program with the teachers, mm -hmm. because uh, what the you know what the what the principal said uh, when I talked to him he said they're they're you know you know what they call they call this burnout. So this term burnout, they're they're about to get there. <laughs> okay, so uh, they're very tired. They're very. Um, uh, stress and I have to start preparing the next year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I'm doing a problem with, with, with that group and, and, the, and Santana is relatively peaceful. You know, it's a, it's a, it's a big city, mm -hmm. um, but we'll, we'll do it hundred uh, percent uh, online. So, um, mm -hmm. but that's, that's the you know rare case when I get away from mm -hmm. the capital, virtually cool. at least, yeah. but uh, yeah, but yeah, we in this country we have stressors that you wouldn't find in the state. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's that's one way of putting it. That's for sure. Yeah. Yes, I mean we we the United States has uh, many issues, um, but uh, not the same as other countries, and uh, yeah, not 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 nearly the same as El Salvador has, and so. And, and every time I do it, every time I do it, I you know I find out what what the stressors are. Mm -hmm. so, as I said, I'm doing this in July. I'm doing this with this with a small company in in Virginia. It's in I think it's in Arlington, mm -hmm. and um, we're about to do a, a poll. Mm -hmm. 
So the participants, you know, tell me what is stressing you. Mm -hmm. So, cause I, I like to do this, uh, uh, it's not one size fits all. It's, you know, what, what is stressing you? So sure. I might find, you know, some differences, not many, but some differences from the, the work I do here in Guatemala, Honduras or, or El Salvador. Mm -hmm. But I like to first find out, and that's my, you know, journalism background. I first, I ask, first yeah. I research. And, I, and that has helped me with my books as well. Mm -hmm. I have to do a lot of research first. Oh yeah, of course. Well, that's, that's a, it's a, it's a good segue into it. Cause I, I wanted to ask about, uh, I guess mostly the, the second book, uh, which you, uh, put out. Um, and, uh, so, so tell us what was the, uh, inspiration for, for writing the book? Um, you know, what's your main thesis? Um, you know, is this, you know, who's your audience? Is this for like, you know, just anybody personally to pick it up and, uh, and, and to read it, or is it more for, um, you know, companies and, and businesses or you just kind of tell us, you know, kind of the, the, the overview of, of all of those components. Okay. So the audience, the audience of the book is anyone who's trying to tackle personal change, mm -hmm. which is hard. Mm -hmm. You know, anyone who has gone uh, on a diet knows it's hard, you know, to keep it, to not bounce back. So uh, the, the story is interesting because my, my first book was published in February uh, 2020. Mm -hmm. One month later, the pandemic came. Mm -hmm. So for like three or four days, I was, uh, you know, the name of the book is The Survival Handbook for Stressful Workplaces. Mm -hmm. And one month later, all workplaces were closed. <laughs> so I was no way. Uh, it, you know, it took me eight years of suffering and one year to write it for this book and workplaces, stressful workplaces are now closed. So anyway. The stressful workplace was now at home with uh, yeah. everything else at home. <laughs> exactly. So um, I have to update that, that book. Okay. Uh -huh. It's still useful, still very useful. You know, mm -hmm. people still buying it, but, but it's, uh, things have changed. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in March we were, we went into lockdown. Uh, I think it was, uh, March, uh, 20, 21st or March. Yeah. March 20, something like that. We went into total lockdown. And I believe I remember correctly, uh, I could be fuzzy on this, but I know much of Latin America or many Latin American countries, had some pretty strict lockdown relative to the United States or, or maybe some other countries. I mean, it oh, was, yeah. it was very, very strict. I mean, <laughs> couldn't really, really could not leave your front door. Right. Yeah. I could go out. There was like a lottery with your, uh, with your ID. Mm -hmm. Let's say the, let's say social security. If he, only social security that end up in seven can go out on Monday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And go to the supermarket yeah. mm. and buy and go buy toilet paper. <laughs> right. So, uh, yeah, it was, it was like, like three weeks, the, the three or four weeks that was very, very, very strict. Mm -hmm. But, um, what happened is with, you know, as I've told you, my background in, in crisis is I started uh, two things happened. The jobs I had started in February, they all, you know, they all, stopped yeah, yeah. Okay? and there was two of them two of them were big projects uh -huh. i was very excited about them and they no more uh, at first they would say uh w w let's wait let's wait and see what happens but you know it, they never happen okay right, yeah so that's one thing and the other thing is i had clients i had former clients that had worked with me in crisis that were hit they were in critical um, industries, mm. travel, uh, hospitality, food. Mm -hmm. So I start, I start getting those calls from former clients to listen, we are, you got to help us. Uh, we're, <laughs> we're shut down. And mm -hmm. we, uh, first the crisis and then help us in, you have to understand when you work a crisis with a client, um, 
you you forge a very deep uh, relationship because they have to tell you everything. They have to tell you everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, with my journalism background, I ask everything. I ask the tough questions. So you you have to if you want me to help you, you have to tell me everything. Mm -hmm. So normally, when we end, when we finish uh, one of these relationships, they're very um, grateful and they're very fond of you know what you did for them. And we normally we keep in touch. So uh -huh. those are you know those are relationships that. Many of those, I, you know, I go back and do something else for them. Uh -huh. So I got these calls and they wanted to help with the crisis, but they also started asking, um, we need to reinvent ourselves. Can you help us? You work in change. Can you help us reinvent our business, our business model? And I had done in my change management experiences, I had done business model change. And like 10 years ago, I created my own model. You know, I, I went to the um, Blue Ocean model. I went to the Kamba model. I went to this other Japanese model. And I created my own formula to help a client like 10 years ago hmm. to do a, a business model transformation. That, that's what I did. Hmm. And that was a, a huge project. It, 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 it lasted um, almost a year. So I learned a lot in uh, working with business models. So I went back to that old formula I had that I had used, you know, four, four or five more times during the last 10 years. And I went back to that formula and I, but at the same time, I was helping with crisis. I was, you know, guiding them in business model transformation or reinvention or business reinvention. But at the same time, I'm, at the same time, I had to reinvent myself hmm. because when I, you know, when these three projects that I was starting, you know, suddenly I had them no more and I saw the trend of not doing uh, physical things, physical trainings anymore or for a long period of time, sure. I also needed to reinvent my business, mm -hmm. okay? So I was dealing with clients and I was dealing with what do I do? How do I, you know, how do I... So all of this mix got me into the idea of, um, of, of refreshing the formula I had. Mm. So I started doing, how do I use this for my clients and how do I use it for me? How do I reinvent my, my business? So I started thinking in what I did was in, then started doing some research. So what has worked? What has worked for me? What has worked for my clients in the past? And what has worked for someone else? So at the end of uh, March, the last days of March, I I said uh, I was working on a, you know on 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 models, I, I do I do a lot of creative work. I, I have my own models, I have my own programs, and I'm, I'm not afraid to create from scratch or to put A and B together and make a new model. So I've, I've been always, I've always had that, you know, that uh, uh, daring, you know, daring mindset of doing it my own way. So, uh, so I came with this formula and how to do it, and then and, and then I had the, the, it was the first time at the end of March that I had the idea. Why don't I just write all this? Why don't I just write another book? Since my book, my first book is useless now. <laughs> why don't Why don't I write a second book? So I I, I started you know writing the first ideas for a new book uh, by the end of March. So so it was those ten days of March, you know, the last ten days of March that I was in constant um, uh, thinking and managing the crisis of my clients and thinking about what am I going to do with my own business. So that's how the, the, the book was born. Uh, it's a book about reinvention, it's mm -hmm. personal reinvention, because what I understood by working with my clients was that if you want to reinvent your business, you first have to reinvent yourself. 
there's have to be a shift in how you manage yourself if, either if you're the owner or the ceo or the sales um, director whatever whatever and the other thing that happened is was many people being fired mm -hmm. and many people you know having to switch careers or start a business because you suddenly didn't have a job mm -hmm. so that's how the the book um came along it's um i was uh playing with the title and i was um i was i toyed around with several concepts like uh, awakening reawakening new beginning uh, um relaunch reset and i ended up with restart uh -huh. because restart implies that it's it's from zero but it's but it's but it's totally how, how do i say this you you start again but you start differently uh -huh. okay so um and then i started you know like uh working on the structure of the book and then i realized uh, as i started writing i realized that it wasn't you know the rest the restart wasn't the doing wasn't enough you first had to have have a switch in the way you think in the way you approach the way you think about yourself mm -hmm. so then by the you know by as I had started writing, like I had been writing for a month, probably in in, in May, I, I realized that I had that I needed something else before. I needed to evolve first, and then restart. Mm -hmm. so that's why the book is called Evolve and Restart. And as I continued writing, I came up with an uh, acronym, mm -hmm. which is uh, what I call the Restart Mindset. And the Restart Mindset is just an acronym. Mm -hmm. restart, restart mindset is this mindset is this acronym formed by the first letters of the word restart mm -hmm. so i shuffled around the, what i had written and or, uh, reordered it in that in that in that in that um, in that acronym so there's a uh the first chapter is about the brain mm -hmm. how the brain the mind work Mm -hmm. And it's like the, you know, science-based foundation. Mm -hmm. And then the next seven, seven chapters, it's eight chapters, it's the next seven chapters, I the, the word restart, R-E-S-T-A-R-T. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's how we reorder the book and change the title to Evolve and Restart. So the three first letters, the four first chapters, no, the chapter one and the three first letters, those four chapters are about evolving, evolving how you use your inner resources, how you deal with emotions, how you deal with your ego, how you uh, conquer awareness, self-awareness, how you conquer acceptance, which is very stoic uh, concept. And then the last four letters, uh, T-A-R-T, are the doing, the restart. Mm -hmm. First, you, so you switch how you operate inside, and then you start doing, doing differently. So the last two chapters are about habit, habit formation, and mm -hmm. in what I call uh, setting up a new lifestyle, which is, which is habit automatization, mm -hmm. okay? So that's how the how that's how the book came about. I finished it in uh, January of this year, and um, editing and proofwriting and all that stuff that you need to do with the book. Uh, so it was published in March 10 mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. No, that's great. So evolve and restart. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I have a, a few uh, questions here. So you definitely pull from a, a lot of folks uh, work, uh, some of the work that they've done and, and really incorporate that. Uh, well, you've, um, I think in the beginning, it might have been in the first chapter, I can't recall. 
where you take uh, some, some listeners may know this, you know, so John Haidt, social psychologist, you know, he wrote the um, happiness hypothesis, I think is what it was. Yes. Um, long time ago now, it's, it's been yes. out for a while. It's been out for a while. And he has that, that um, very popular, very common, many people have heard it at this point, um, you know, the writer and the elephant kind of thing. You know, the elephant is more the emotions, the writer is the brain and the cognition, the whole thing and how one controls the other or how they work in tandem, et cetera. And so you kind of explain this uh, in, in the in the first part, and uh, you know, kind of just tell us how you use that as a kind of model and built off of that for because you reference it throughout the book, you know, as a as a type of skeleton or framework for um, uh, some of the ideas that you um, put forth. Yes, when I had my uh, health crisis, uh, burnout, and all this thing. Um, I, that, that's one of the, you know, with the reinventions of my life. And, and I talk along the book uh, of, you know, five or six situations in my life where I've had to reinvent myself. And that was one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was very important with, because my, my health was, was at risk. Uh, to this day, I, I have a psychosomatic illness. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I drink pills for that. But mostly I work on my, you know, inner, inner resources, my internal pharmacy, if you will. Uh -huh. But um, when I uh, was at the hospital, uh, you know, I, I knew something had to change. And um, I was with a therapist and I, I work with a neuroscientist here that um, he had dealt with stress before. So I went to him and, and, and what he said, uh, you know, listen, you you have to change your lifestyle completely if you, you know, if you want to heal. So I went to a diet. I lose, I lost 60 pounds wow. in eight months, wow. but I never gained them back. So I did change my lifestyle and the book, the book, the one book that helped me so much and guided me was um, switch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in that book, uh, Dan and uh, remember the other name, Heath, uh, it's two brothers, two academics, they use that metaphor, the writer and the elephant. And it's a very popular book. And the, but that book transformed my life. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I, I, I give them their due credit. I, yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tell that story in, in my book. Mm -hmm. But um, later on, I found out where the metaphor came from the metaphor the writer and the elf comes from Jonathan Haidt mm -hmm. and he borrowed it from a, a Plato metaphor which is the chariot and the and the writer mm -hmm. so um so I use that metaphor um it's the thread in my book is the writer and elf and metaphor so I but but I explain at the beginning um uh, why I do and where it comes from. But I started using that metaphor uh, 10 years ago in my trainings. Mm. Because when I, I had already been studying the brain, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but I, I went in deeper when I had my crisis. With my health crisis, I went and kept studying. In but I, I, I've been uh, using for years that metaphor in trainings because once you understand that many of your behaviors are non, you know, are, are not intentional but automatic, they come from your emotional brain. Once you understand it, and I found that I found that in trainings. Once you understand that, mm -hmm. it's easier for you to change, and that's what happened to me. Once I understood that, why, once I understood that many of my behaviors were compulsive or reactive and that I had the choice to control them and to be aware of them, that may change easier. Mm -hmm. So I started, you know, teaching that in my trainings. And that's why I fully believe in that, in, you know, in that, in that concept of um, you know system one and system two, which right. um, you know Dan, that, Dan Kahneman, mm -hmm. Danny Kahneman, uh, 
you know, explains so detailed and so good in his Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow book, um, which won him a Nobel Prize. Yeah, and he just came out with a new book with. Uh, oh yes, with yes. Uh, oh, I'm forgetting the other author. Two other authors I'm forgetting at the moment. Um, I've read about a quarter of it uh, thus far. It's uh, it's good. It's very much a similar style of writing and stuff like that. But uh, it talks about noise, uh, bias, and noise and the differences. Yeah. And so it is very very interesting. So, but 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 I'm but I'm a firm believer if you understand your brain biases, mm -hmm. change gets easier. Mm -hmm. So that's a foundation of my first book and my second book. But in, in the second book, I, you know, I, I use the metaphor all along the book. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a, there's a nice consistent thread that that is there. It's it's a kind of, you know, kind of it's like a home base of sorts that you kind of come back to, and and it's it's nice. It's it's it is a there's some really nice consistency that that is there. Um, so I I mean I don't want to go through every single letter, but maybe maybe a kind of how you broke down the two aspects of it is helpful for the first chapter and then the first three or four letters uh, as far as the uh, essentially cognitive change and then the last three or whatever is for the more of the behavioral change. So maybe talk about it in that way in these kind of two uh, sections with the, the restart. So yeah. the, 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 the R is restrain your ego, the E is eject the old self, uh, S is shift to full acceptance, and T is tailor new intentions. Is that all part of the first category or first grouping? No, the first three. The first three, excuse me. Yeah, so it's the first, first, first chapter, which is which doesn't have a letter, which is uh, about the uh, brain. It's called, it's a brain, always a brain. That's, mm -hmm. that's another thing. Mm -hmm. So in that first chapter, I, I explained the metaphor. I explained the, you know, biases and mindsets and beliefs. And what is important uh, in that, chapters that I explained, it's all in your nervous system. You know, you can't control that. It's all there. Mm -hmm. So then the first three letters are the evolved part, which is the cognitive part, which is, it's an identity, identity based concept. So evolve is how do you switch your identity and your cognitive uh, patterns. So that's R for restrain your ego, E for eject the old you, and S for shift to full attendance, uh, acceptance. And that what it means is that ego plays tricks on us. So ego, uh, um, can remember who called it the roommate. So I talk about the you know, ego as the roommate. Mm -hmm. But what, but it's, it's really about self-awareness. You know, that cha the ego chapter is about self-awareness. It's about understanding your biases, understanding your, your um, challenges with what you believe to be true and that you don't question anymore. So it's about self-awareness. And eject the old you is very interesting. Um, and I get a lot of, uh, I get a lot of um, replies for, uh, from this chapter, which is about unlearning. And that's one of the hardest things to do. And once you understand how the brain works, you understand why unlearning is so hard because it's it's a biology. It's a biology of your brain. You know, something you have done for 30 years. And and this is the the, the, the projects in my work that I that I like the best is when you you have to switch from something uh, you have done for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, to a new, and I'll give you a quick example. I worked a couple of years ago with a company that they're in retail, they're all over the country. And they're the, the biggest um, um, snacks company here. Mm. So I worked with them and they had to switch their the whole sales force. And some of them had been there for 30, 34 years. And they do the, when they sold to the little shops all over the country, they do the receipt in, in, in writing. And after 34 years of doing the, the, the thing by hand, you know, the receipt, the invoice, they had to do it in a handheld. Mm. So there was this, you know, people have been doing it. So that change is very hard because something you are used to do, it's, it's, it becomes your biology, it becomes your, your neural pathway in your brain. So unlearning is one of my favorite chapters 
uh, unlearning. So it's Jake Tewot. And the next chapter, which is a shift to full acceptance, is with the last chapter in the evolve section, the part one. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's about the I have this, I have this theory. This you have to conquer emotional flexibility. And the first step for emotional flexibility is acceptance. Mm-hmm. Once you stop fighting with those things you can't control, you liberate you liberate space. You make space for a new way of thing, seeing things. So this uh, chapter is interesting because I go on, you know, I, I do a list of 12 things, you know, you have to accept these things, you know, and let them go. Cut your attachments. Uh, you have to accept your past. You have to accept uh people around you how they is how they are you have to accept that there always be problems you have to accept uncertainty remember i started writing this during the pandemic so you know one thing we all have to accept is uncertainty get comfortable with not knowing what happens tomorrow Mm -hmm. because the more you fight with things you don't control the more you suffer so that's the first part and the second Second part is more the behavioral part, if you will, that um, deals with tailor new intentions. So basically what I'm saying here is manage your attention, you know, have a purpose, have mm-hmm. a goal. Um, and I do share in my book, my, my goal setting model, which mm-hmm. is uh, Becca goals. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is a little different uh, from, you know, smart goals and that kind of thing that, that's out there. Mm-hmm. And then, um, because one of the things I, I do believe firmly is that, that for, for change to happen, for change to be successful, you have to learn how to manage your attention. And then if you manage attention, then comes the second, the, the, the following part, which is align your energy, A, for align your energy, which is, Focus your attention and then discipline your actions. Mm-hmm. You know, actions follow one clear purpose. So sort of clarity of purpose, clarity of goals is very important in behavioral change. And then the last two chapters are reset your habits and turn it into a lifestyle. Those are the two mm-hmm. last chapters, which is intentional behaviors. Uh, and that's, you know, the tip so that tips of uh, building habits you know, start small deal with your environment and that the last chapter is turned into a lifestyle which is make change sustainable by making it automatic once you have new habits in automatic mode you have changed your lifestyle which is ha- which is what happened to me i didn't you know i didn't gain my weight back I never stopped doing meditation. I haven't stopped doing exercise for the last 10 years. So, you know, the new things I did, I made sure that I didn't stop doing them. So it's building new habits. It's good, but turning it, turning it into lifestyle is better. So that's why habits has, you know, the last two chapters because I want to make sure that the change is sustainable. You don't bounce back. So um, this is, uh, I don't like the term self-help. I like better the coach yourself book. This is a coach yourself book. And it has one more than 100 exercises. You you got to read it, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're spread out through out the chapters uh, these yes. kind of brief exercises that are still yeah, out. Yeah. So there's uh there's like brief exercises and small actions mm-hmm. and when you i hadn't done it I, I, I did a couple of days ago i counted them i hadn't counted them oh okay because I, I you know i i went to the text and i separated them mm-hmm, so it's mm-hmm. 100 in exercises and, and and actions it's more than 100. Mm. so i didn't realize it was so many because I, you know, I use them in my, in my workshops, in my training. Mm-hmm. So, um, yeah, that's a book. It's a personal reinvention uh, with a framework that guides you to change that is sustainable. You yeah. know, and it's a sequence. You know, the restart is, is a sequence. Uh, so what I did is I made sure that you wouldn't bounce back. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I was going to say that you had it in the, I think the last chapter, last two, one of the last two chapters uh, mentioned um, James Clear's Atomic Habits, which oh, was, yes. it was uh, what I was reading. I was like, oh, there's a lot of, I saw a lot of similarities uh, or and or influence from that as well. So I was like, oh, okay. You know, there, there's the, the reference there as well, which uh, for listeners that don't know, James Clear wrote this book, Atomic Habits, which was, you know, pretty popular and uh, very tangible. Yeah, you, you would probably classify it as self-help. I don't know if he would classify it that way, but there are very uh, tangible ways of how to build essentially better habits. Um, and so, yeah, I saw in the last you know, chapter or last two chapters, uh, the the kind of nod to, to some of those pieces as well. Um, so yeah, I, I fully go into, I, I, I use two models. I use the James um, Clear model and the... Uh, mm, uh, the other guy, his name is, um, uh, but there's another researcher, which is uh, mm -hmm. famous as well. So he has the ABC model, which mm -hmm. is the atomic model. And so I, you know, I explain them not fully because, you know, the, you can read their books, but but I, right. Right. I give them credit and I explain them and then I, I follow up on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I have a, so I, I think that's great. I mean, I think you, you, you explained it well. I mean, it, you know, having had read it, you know, that's exactly what, you know, how I understood it and, and it is very tangible. So, so I, but what did you think of the book? Who's, who, yeah, who, yeah. Would, who would benefit from, from this? Yeah. Book? So, that's, so that's what I was just getting to. What, what do you think is the, the, the aim in terms of, you had said that the audience was for, um, the you know anyone that wants any kind of like personal change or 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 things like that D does it feel like it is mm, i don't know that does it feel like the the book is written in mind of like for people that want to make personal change and then in a sense apply it to like a, an organization or a business or you know, the, the stay at home mom or the, you know, the person that just clocks in, clocks out and gets a check and, you know, doesn't have like, isn't a big part of a big corporation or something, or the person that works in uh, retail or, you know, what have you. Um, do, is it really for anybody or, or do you have a, a specific uh, kind of grouping of, of people or a certain place where you uh, folks could apply uh, some of these things? Or is it really just anybody and everybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the the the, the latter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah no, I mean, I was the whole time I was thinking strictly in personal terms. Uh huh. Uh huh. So not necessarily group terms. It doesn't come out that way, but it doesn't. It what really was individual is the way yeah. you were focusing on. Uh -huh. uh huh. So let me let me let me give you a you know some briefly some examples of people that has uh you know gave have given me feedback mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know this is it's a great thing when you know you, you amazon gives you the statistics and, and you, yeah. you find out where where the the world in the world the book is being bought and yeah it's, yeah 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 it's amazing you know? I, sometimes i don't believe it you know when someone sends me an email <laughs> from from uh, from um, the other day, I got a uh, uh, email from Belgium, from uh, um, Pakistan, India, Germany. So I have some cases. Uh, there's um, I'll give you I'll give you a couple of cases that people I'm coaching, and they ask me to you know they do the restart mindset with me. But I, yeah, I love your book. It's people that lives here. Mm -hmm. Love your book. Uh, well, there's actually a guy who lives in, in Miami. He's from here, but he lives in Miami. So I love your book, but you know, I can't do those exercises. The, the exercises are great, but I won't do them on my own. So can you coach me through your book? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I've had that far four or five cases like that. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, they know I'm a coach. Mm -hmm. So um, one is this guy lives in Miami. He's selling his business. Okay, he's, uh, he's had a successful business for like 15 years. Mm -hmm. He's selling it and he wants to get into some other business mm -hmm. and he doesn't know what. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that what well, that's an interesting case. There's another guy I'm coaching. 
Uh, he's a he's a old friend of mine, and he's uh, he doesn't like his. He's been in his job of 19 years, and he's he's tired, but he's been afraid because of his age. But he's a has a good position. He's like the CFO. He's got a good position, but he's tired. He doesn't want to be there anymore mm-hmm. for different reasons. Mm-hmm. So, but he's either getting another job or going into consulting and he has the he has everything he has the skill he has the knowledge but he's afraid mm-hmm. so um so i'm i'm thinking. and the other case i'm dealing with coaching here is a uh, a uh, a person who got into a fight with his business partner mm-hmm. so they they split ways and now he says now that this happened, uh, maybe maybe I want to go into some other business, and I have these three ideas. So that's three cases. But uh, emails I've gotten from people who have bought the book, uh, divorced, mm-hmm. people on diet, people with uh, coming out of uh, illnesses. Mm-hmm. I've got people uh, laid out. Mm-hmm that are you know are looking for a job right now i've got a, you know three or four cases of that kind of person and then and, and there's the ones that just want to switch careers they want to do something else that the pandemic you know put them into this frame of mind where you know what should i do with my life now mm-hmm, mm-hmm. uh I, I had this case of a a, a young person She's in Europe. I don't remember the country, but she's uh, she she sent me an email, and she says uh, she she got into a wrong career, and the pandemic helped her understand that she had made a mistake. Mm-hmm. So she wants to go into something else, and mm-hmm. you know she came across a book about it. And so it's it's very personal. I, I never intended for the reader to take this to his or her workplace. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could. But I never thought it for organizations. Thought it in a strictly personal terms, with because it has a lot of possible applications. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, in my case, uh, reinventions in my life. Once I was unemployed, and as I told you earlier, I decided to switch careers. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. And the other the other time was when. 10 years ago when I had this health crisis and I had to totally uh, switch my lifestyle. Mm-hmm. So that implied a lot of uh, new habits and, 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 and I, do it, I, I did it with the guide of, 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 of switch of that particular book. So, mm-hmm. so many of what I learned from switch, uh, you find it in my own terms in, in my book, you know, yeah. it's helped me and it has helped, helped me help my clients. Yeah, yeah, I would say that. Um, I'll I'll give uh, a few things, a few of my um, thoughts about the book, and hearing you explain it, it's really, really, really wonderful. Is um, one of the things that I there's a few there's there's a handful of things I really like about it. Um, one of them is this idea. Of, you say it early in the in the book, uh, something along the lines of. Um, you know, this isn't uh, a cookbook, it's not a recipe, you know, follow steps two, three, and four, and then this is the result. So you're not um, making big promises, right? If you do this, you're going to have, you know, your best life tomorrow. You're, you're, you're not doing that stuff. Um, and I think that's important because I think uh, a lot of folks can, can take, um, I think many times uh, people will, they, they will buy any book really, or, or many books, um, or, or look at certain things or get information and expect answers, right? Uh, you know, it, well, okay, well, you know, it says here, you know, do these exercises. And so if I do these, then this should change, right? They, they want answers, they want the change. And I think you've been fairly transparent about that, right? We got to know how to deal with uncertainty, change is hard, you know, this isn't a, a, a one size fits all per se, or this kind of step by step kind of thing. And I think that that's really good, because I think a lot of books that are, um, you know, we'll, we'll say self help, I, I know you don't like the term, but we'll say in that kind of universe, 
Yeah. Um, if, I, if I were to find it at a, at a Barnes and Noble store, it would probably be in, in kind of that yeah. section. Yeah, um, that's right. uh, you know, I, a lot of them just kind of make these, maybe indirectly, they make these very lofty promises of like, if you do this, you know, it, it's applied for everything. It's applied to everybody and everything and it can fix anything. And, and whether they try to do that or not, and, you know, that's you know, simply not true. And so I think that one of the things that's really uh, encouraging, it's really nice, is you're able to be very upfront about here's, here's what I am seeking to do and here's what uh, I'm not saying. I also think that uh, it's twofold. Uh, you're, you give lots of, not a lot, you give a handful of kind of personal accounts. So some of the ones you've mentioned here about, here's how I've had to make some certain uh, lifestyle changes and certain shifts at certain moments. And, and here's what I've done. And you obviously have, you know, boots on the ground, right? You've been doing this stuff with big organizations and then by proxy with individuals for, you know, 25, 30 years. So I think a lot of that comes through of personally and professionally that this is what I have found to be effective. And so I think that that's the power of the book is that it's, it's not trying to sell something, it's trying to share something. And then through that, it's saying, and here, here are the tools or here are some of the things um, that, that, are, that can be used. Um, I, I do, I will say I have one critique. Um, yeah. This is my, uh, my bias. Um, I think, and this isn't your fault, but I think this is what happens sometimes. Many times people will, um, they will look for, when they have challenges or they have problems, they want, like I said, the answers. And many times they want the answers in the kind of microwave format. Okay, well, just tell me how to do it. You know, yeah, okay, here's the, here's the, you know, the, the do this exercise or here, do these, these few things. Or if I just, you know, follow this and this is going to change or this is going to be outcome. Um, and I think that what can sometimes be, the case is that, you know, obviously that's not the case, right? That people, it takes time to, to change things or change habits. And, and, um, but more than just the cognitive side or the, even the behavioral side of things is that there are, um, there are elements of, let's just say the self that have really deep rooted and deep seated, um, difficulties and challenges from a person's past. People have certain yeah. uh, uh, mental health challenges or disorders, even you know, depression, anxiety is the more common ones, but even ones outside of that. Yeah. There's a lot of emotional dysregulation. There is some trauma. There are interpersonal difficulties and challenges. And sometimes I think the the risk, I guess, and again, this isn't, uh, definitely don't think this is your fault, but uh, maybe from other people, but is some people will, will take reading a book like that, that's very kind of life coaching, very much like applied and uh, applicable and as a replacement of doing very hard work in therapy um, or, or doing very challenging work, um, really deep work within themselves. So it's one thing to change a behavior or a habit or a thought pattern. That's really helpful. And that is done in therapy. But there are other elements of uh, uh, long term therapy, if you will, to really have somebody to understand very, 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 very painful moments um, from their past, from their parents, from their relationships, and then their emotional kinds of states that you know, my bias is you want to have that um, to be done in a space in an environment with a professional that is able to provide some containment and some way of being able to uh, wrestle with those things. Um, and, and I think that, again, I would, I would only hope that uh, people can uh, take your book or, or, or any other book and say, okay, this is really good and really helpful, but not a replacement for doing hard work in treatment and doing hard work in therapy. So I don't think you're selling it that way. So it's not really a critique of you. It's more of a critique of 
you know, any audience that's going to, any, anybody that's going to buy it, you know, th it's not a replacement for, uh, for, for that kind of stuff. And I would say that for anybody. I mean, if a psychologist, you know, has been doing it for 30 years, has been, you know, writes a book, that's not a replacement for, for, yeah. for treatment. or, you know, uh, some people will say, well, I listened to a podcast with a therapist that, uh, uh, you know, does simulate it or, or sometimes gives so many examples from, you know, their, their personal therapy sessions um, uh, with clients. And so I'm just kind of getting that and I don't have to, I don't really have to do mine. And, and I think that that's, um, you know, if people don't want to do therapy, they don't want to do therapy. But I think that they should not try to say, well, I, I, I watched the YouTube video, or I read a book or I listened to a podcast and, and, uh, and that's all I need. It's, good. it's just the same. It's good enough. Um, and so that's always my, sometimes my worry with, uh, with some, with some, uh, uh, elements that will, will say, you know, some, some kind of sort of adjacent to, to that kind of thing. So I don't know, what, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on any of that? I'm totally with you. I'm totally with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, as a matter of fact, I, uh, I will tell you two things. One is that. I was very careful in, in my wife, who has been my, you know, my edit, you know, one of my editors, my, you know, let's say my chief editor. She's an and, editor in chief for free. <laughs> yeah. And, and um, she's very thoughtful and she knows me a lot and, you know, she, yeah. she, she knows my, you know, what I read, what I, you know, and what I do. So she's, um, she always um, help help me keep my feet on the ground. Mm. And what do I mean by that? It's don't go into you know don't go into uh, uh, sensible territories. Mm -hmm. You know I am very critical of uh, bad leadership, for mm -hmm. example. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, she would find references. Um, that this more for my first book because mm -hmm. um, you know there was a whole chapter in toxic boxes, mm -hmm. toxic toxic bosses. Sorry. Mm -hmm. um, and she would be careful. You know, you don't know who's gonna read this. And <laughs> and in the second book, uh, she was very one of the things she warned me about is you know don't go into you know more deeper issues. And. And she, you know, she made me, you know, she helped me keep my feet on the ground. And so I was aware of that. I, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All the time I was aware of, you know, don't, don't go into far because, um, you know, I've been to therapy, you know, um, but I, I have, I have a coach, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, they say you, you know, a real coach if you don't have someone coaching you. <laughs> so I have a coach. <laughs> yeah. I've been in therapy for, you know, several times in my life. So um so i was always aware of you know don't go too deep because uh, there might be some issues where i haven't been you know who i i don't know so i haven't you know i haven't worked with that so i'm not even if i read a lot about that i'm i'm not in so i kept the book on the grounds where i have experience okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i went i did my best not to go too far yeah, no, and in the book, it, it doesn't, it does not come out that way. It, it does, uh, it does not come out that way, which um, uh, when I read it, I was like, oh, that's great. Cause I've, you know, I read everything. Right. And so I, I was, I've read a lot of books kind of in that universe and they will do that. And I, and I'm like white knuckling in my chair and I'm cringing. I'm like, oh no, don't do this. Um, and so I thought that was really, really, uh, really, really wonderful that you didn't do that. And so I always, I always just, you know, you can't control what people do or say, but, you know, just kind of to, to, to listeners, it's like, you know, I'll say one thing that you just mentioned about the coach and the, and the and, and therapy. <clears throat> I've also been on the other side of that, you know, so I've had my own therapy at different points in my life, but as, as someone that does, you know, therapy, you know, for my day job, I, I have worked with plenty of clients that they will say they'll have a life coach and then I'll be the therapist. And, and we will, we will have the kind of lanes, right. Yeah. You know, and we'll say like, I'll say like, Oh, you know, this is something that you should bring up with, you know, your life coach, whenever you meet with them, that sounds like that's more of, 
their domain. I don't want to step on their toes. I, I don't do that stuff. And, oh, okay. And then, you know, sometimes they'll say like, oh, I met with my life coach and they're like, you should probably tell your therapist that, you know, that sounds like kind of more his, you know, so sometimes there will be this collaborative thing of like, both um, have utility and both can be uh, helpful. And I'm not trying to put them on an equal plane. I'm just trying to say that there's a, there's a different category of where things go. And, and so I, I, I hope uh, uh, people hear that. And I, I think they do. I think as best you can, it does come out through the book um, of what you are and what you aren't doing. And so I remember when reading the first chapter, I was like, oh, good. You know, he's, he's real transparent about this. So that was, that was very encouraging to see. Yeah, actually, I do um, uh, disclaimers at the beginning. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I noticed that, and I said, "Oh, good, 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 good." That's that's honest. I think that's honest in, writing, in, honest work. One of those disclaimers is, you know, I repeat, I repeat on purpose, uh -huh. <laughs> not because I don't, I, I forgot that I already told you this. Just because repetition works, and I, you know, mm -hmm. in, in in my background in communications, if someone, I something I've learned is that you have to repeat yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and science has proved that repetition works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, so. I think that's, I think, I, so I think that's great. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think for that, that was like my, my big question was, oh, what was the aim and, and, and who is the audience? And I think knowing that is helpful because it's like, okay, I think what you're setting out to do uh, is you do it. And, and I think it's, it can be very helpful and beneficial to, to, to many people. And so in yeah. that way, I think it's, um, it's, it's fantastic. Yeah. I, I guess uh, one, one final question I have here is, um, do you have plans to, you know, write more books in the future? And if so, what would you, what would you try and, uh, and tackle? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I think you, once you write your first book, uh, it's very hard to stop. Okay. <laughs> cause, um, you know, cause I'm, cause I'm such an avid reader. And then since, since, since I started writing my second book, I've read so much after that, that's yeah, it. Yeah. You know? yeah, yeah. And, and, and what you learn is that you never stop learning. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, I've been I've been giving it some thought, and um, I have two potential um, topics. One is cultural change, mm -hmm. because uh, you know because it's what I, you know, what I do on a daily. As you say, that's my day job. <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 My day job is cultural change, mm -hmm. and and the other topic is um, you know uh, leadership in the new world something mm. some of those lines also you know from what i learned in as i said earlier um, in places where i couldn't work with the with management with leadership i said listen uh, let me help your people then. so i've heard so many stories mm. in mm. stressful workplaces that from that experience, I would, you know, I would like to write about that, what, the, yeah. you know, the relationship, you know, direct relationship between stressed worker and management style and leadership mm. style. Mm, that's yeah. great. Yeah, that's great. And if you, if you take it broader and then it's culture, what, what defines culture? What, what, mm -hmm. what, what does it take to change culture and what defines it? Uh, and the first thing is leadership, but you know, there's systems, there's environment, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of factors, but the, the main yeah, factor is always very complex. leadership. No, that's, that's, that sounds very, very, very uh, needed and, and useful, especially, especially now. So, um, well, well, look, this was, this was fantastic. It was, it was great. I am. Um, I, I don't, I'm not in this world and uh, crisis management, stress management, organizational stuff. And, and, <laughs> and then some of the, and some of the stuff you cover in the book, it's, it's not, uh, it's not necessarily my world. So I always like pushing myself uh, into hearing and, and, and learning and listening. So, which, which, which was really great. Um, tell, tell listeners where, where they can find you online and where they can get your book and any of the relevant uh, places. 
Yeah, okay. I'm, um, I'm active in LinkedIn. Uh, that's my favorite uh, platform, Luis. I remember Jennifer Lopez, Luis Lopez, Portillo. Uh, Portillo is kind of hard to remember, but uh, Jennifer Lopez, Luis Lopez, <laughs> Portillo. I'm um, in LinkedIn. I'm in Twitter. I'm active in Twitter. And that's about it. Um, in Twitter, I'm L. Lopez Portillo. Uh, Where can people get your book? Amazon. Amazon? Okay. Only Amazon. I gave them exclusive rights. <laughs> okay. Okay. So it's, it's easier that way. It's a digital copy or a physical copy. Yeah, okay. either way. Okay. So it's Evolve and Restart, uh, my latest book. Okay. So thank you. Thank well, you. Yeah, so no, no. Thank you for, for your time and, and your knowledge and... Uh, and, and your work, I, uh, I think it's it's really really fantastic, um, you know the work that you're doing and and uh, and how how you're you know, trying to, to to legitimately be uh, someone that is a, a problem solver and uh, we need we need more of that. So uh, keep doing the work you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you much for for having me, Savior. Of course, of course. Alrighty, I'll see you. you. Did a lot. All right. Thank you.